Tudors are one of the best known dynasties in world history. They took England from raging civil wars and the brink of ruin and transformed it into a powerhouse on the world stage. From their romances to their health, the fate of the country was closely linked to their personal lives. We've seen how Henry VII loved and lost and how the untimely death of a young prince created one of the most notorious kings in history. But what really went on behind the closed doors of their palaces? In this episode, we look at the life of King Henry VIII, his gargantuan appetite for food, sport and women, his endless quest for an heir, and of course, the horrific leg injury that plagued most of his adult life. Welcome to the private lives of the Tudors. Make way! Make way! The king! The king! Come on! Oh, no. King Henry VIII had been on the throne for 27 years, but on the 24th of January, 1536, his reign very nearly came to an end at a tournament in Greenwich when he suffered an almost fatal accident while jousting. Henry, in full armor, fell from his horse, which in turn fell on him. One report said he was unconscious for two hours and there seemed to be no hope for him. But true to form, Henry did regain consciousness. The Henry that emerged, though, was very different from the Henry before the accident. Contemporary accounts recorded a marked change in his personality. No longer the happy, generous, and athletic king, he was now depressed, paranoid, and plagued by health problems. This was the beginning of Henry the Tyrant. A lot of people thought that he was going to die and it does seem to have possibly changed his personality. He's capable of being quite brutal the whole way along. Personally, my own view is that Henry was always capricious. He was always capable of making a very hard and basic calculation about people, and he was completely unsentimental. When you were, when you were eaten up and you were useless to him, he spat you out and threw you away. Henry had always been a fit, and handsome man, renowned for his fine calf muscles and his pretty rounded face. But after the jousting accident, his health had begun to deteriorate. He was no longer able to take part in the sports that he had loved, and his leg had become painfully ulcerated. It was a problem that would stay with him for the rest of his life. There's no question that the accident of 1536 um, opens up an old wound and, and it, it, it causes uh, a second injury on the other leg. And the injuries on his legs are undoubtedly, but that, that's eventually what's going to kill him because there are no antibiotics, so these are reinfecting wounds. Uh -huh. And they must have been very painful. No! As he becomes more sick, uh, physically sick, I'm sure his temper becomes shorter. Well, who's, who's wouldn't? And I'm sure he can be more um, unpredictable. His explosive temper and volatile mood swings were a constant source of fear to his ministers at court. On several occasions, it was reported that he became violent, lashing out at even his most trusted confidants. <laughs> 
As he becomes more housebound, chairbound, bedbound, he loves to frighten people and he enjoys that whole business of tormenting people. And he likes the fact that they find him unreadable. The ulcer on his leg would have been very painful because they believed in keeping it open to allow the pus to keep coming out because they thought that would stop the ill humours building up in his body. The other problem was, of course, it was very ugly. And this is a man who has prided himself on his appearance. This is a time, too, when the health of the king is considered very important because the king is, after all, the leader. So it was very difficult for Henry to be less than the fantastic specimen of manhood that he had once been. Ill-tempered and racked with constant pain, Henry had to be regularly attended by his personal medical team. These Tudor physicians were something only the very wealthy could afford, charging around 10 shillings for their services, which was out of reach for the vast majority. But despite their large fees, they were still limited in terms of their medical expertise. Most of what they knew had been based on ancient writings from the likes of Aristotle and Hippocrates, or old wives' tales that had been handed down through generations. Tudor medicine was based on the idea of the four humours, so basically hot, cold, wet and dry. The idea was that those four elements should be in perfect balance in your body, and when they got out of balance, you got ill. If your doctor considered that the reason for your illness was that you were too hot and dry, he would prescribe things that would make you colder and wetter. He might well prescribe you all sorts of changes to your diet. So, for example, young animals were considered to be hotter than older ones. So you might be told to eat meat from young animals rather than older ones, which would sound rather strange to us today. But from the way they thought, it was perfectly sensible. Astrology and horoscopes also played a big part in determining Henry's health and how he should be treated. It may seem strange, but from birth, Henry's star sign was closely monitored. Doctors maintained that the king, who was born under the astrological sign of cancer, was governed by the maternal cycles of the moon. Henry's horoscope suggested that he'd be vulnerable to such diseases as smallpox, rheumatism, and even kidney stones. To this day, Henry's astrological clock remains here at Hampton Court. Designed by the king's clockmaker, Nicholas Kratzer, it shows all 12 signs of the zodiac, the cycles of the moon, and the position of the sun. His birth chart had cast him as a cheerful and happy child who would grow up to become a man of action. He would be ill-tempered, eat and drink to excess, sensitive to criticism, and have a healthy libido. Maybe there was something in it after all. But there was one thing above all others that continued to worsen Henry's ailments. His love of excessive eating. I've come to the kitchens at Hampton Court Palace to see food historian Mark Meltonville. So I understand this is one of your favourite part of the palace. I love the Tudor kitchens here. I think you get more of a sense of how the court operates here than in any other part of the palace. But you're the food expert. You talk me through it. Well, I like to think of this as sort of the beating heart of the palace. I mean, yes, you've got the courtiers upstairs swishing around in their posh dresses, but this is where over 200 people are sweating away, producing meals twice a day for four, five, six hundred people. It's just fantastic. It's a production line, and you know, over your shoulder there, a familiar sight. The pies, is that all they ate? <laughs> No, shame it's not. Uh, this entire room is dedicated to the roasting of meat, so roasted beef and mutton, 
Uh, the pies are secondary, really. They're through the hatch. They're waiting to go up to the Great Hall. Well, lead on through. What do we have in the next chamber? This is our favourite. This is our veritable cathedral to food. Amazing. During Henry's reign, the royal court was constantly increasing in size, which meant that there were a lot of mouths to feed. So in 1529, he had the palace kitchens extended to meet the demands of his hungry courtiers. At its height, the great kitchen comprised 55 rooms spanning over 3,000 square feet, where its 200 strong staff were tasked with serving 600 meals twice a day. We're here in what probably was the biggest and busiest kitchen in the world. And this is the heart of it. What would have gone on here? Whose food would have been cooked in this part of the kitchen? Well, obviously everyone thinks this is the kitchen for the king, because why wouldn't you? But the king had his own private or privy kitchen. His meals were served to him and his inner circle and cooked in a much smaller space. What we're sat in is basically the works canteen, but it's so much more than that. They must have got through a gargantuan quantity of food every single day. Yep, on time, no excuses. This is, this is like a modern hotel. Everything works like clockwork. One of the myths about Henry VIII is that he was very uncouth when dining, you know, there was the throwing of the chicken legs and it was all a bit raucous, but it wasn't really like that at all, was it? No, we, we, we don't think so because we have a couple of cookbooks, but we have even more manners books survive from that period. So we know how you were supposed to dine politely and someone like Henry VIII, he's going to be trained from birth to behave properly, to behave like a king. And the one thing they didn't like was the idea of you eating like an animal. We're not animals, we are man and you don't chew on bones. What would have been a typical meal? Would it have been three courses? Um, did he choose from different dishes? Here it gets complicated because the answer is yes, but when we think of a course, we think of a plate of food. So if I say three courses for you for dinner, you're thinking of three separate things. A course in Tudor times, in fact through most of British history, is a buffet, a small buffet for you, me and two others referred to as a mess. So we'd sit here and a selection of food is brought before us and that's showing the wealth of your host. Well, it was tailor-made for fussy eaters, wasn't it, really? If you didn't like one dish, you could just choose another one. That's the point. No one leaves a royal table dissatisfied. Roasted meats were available at almost every meal at court. Most people of the time, if they were lucky enough, would have eaten preserved meat but fresh meat year-round was a sign of wealth and opulence. Roasting was hugely expensive, not just for the cost of the fuel, but because you had to pay someone called a spit boy to constantly attend it. There is no meal without the roasted meat, and within the roasting kitchens there are six fires like this. Um, four spits on each, we reckon at least 100 pounds of meat needed on every fireplace just to get the whole court fed. Um, we've only got two pieces on here because this is just choice for you. And what do we have here? What's the meat? I've got the two most common meats roasted here because everyone expects a deer or a boar. Yes, they oat those, but um, every day there is fine roast beef, the best of England, and fine roast mutton. Mm. And there is quite a lot of skill involved, isn't there, Robert? It looks like a fairly monotonous job, certainly a very hot yes. job. Um, but, but how skilled were these spit well, turners? You do have to keep your wits about you. You have to examine the meat, make sure it's not overdone. It is not the most job with most variety, but it's an important job because this is a really extravagant way of cooking. Probably the most extravagant way of cooking ever invented. Ridiculous, you're burning a ton of seasoned oak per fire per day. Outrageous. So all of this is making me pretty hungry. Do I get to try some of this meat? You do, and in true Tudor fashion, we can't tell you what to have. You get to choose between a fine piece of English beef or a slightly more rare mutton. I think I'm going for the rare mutton. That sounds delicious. Thank you. Good choice. I'll just let Robert come to a halt. Thank you very much. And cut some of this off. Well, I'm going to be like Henry VIII, take a fairly delicate piece to begin with. 
That is absolutely delicious. I think that's the best mutton I've ever tasted. People always think it's going to be really dry because they see it go around the fire and going quite dark, but that's actually all the juice cooking on the outside. It's really, really moist. <laughs> With all that food, the courtiers needed something to wash it down with. Henry had three large cellars in his palace, and with good reason. An incredible 600,000 gallons of ale were consumed at court every year, and wine imported from Gascony was held here in over 300 oak casks. At any one time, there would have been 15,000 gallons of it available. The king himself certainly had a taste for wine, which in Tudor times was incredibly expensive. And that made it all the more impressive when Henry marked festivals and special occasions by ordering the construction of lavish wine fountains, like the one on display here at Hampton Court. Revelers would have been greeted by these remarkable Tudor drinks dispensers and allowed to help themselves to the seemingly endless supply of wine that flowed from their spouts. He certainly knew how to throw a party. Food and drink meant Henry was growing in size, which certainly kept his tailors and craftsmen busy. As king, Henry didn't have to lose weight to fit into his clothes and armour. He simply had new ones made. Three suits of armour kept here at the Tower of London revealed just how much he grew in size over the years. The most skilled armour makers of the time were German. So Henry had some of these craftsmen brought over and established at a workshop in Greenwich, where they spent their whole time making the king's armour. He had been greatly impressed by the eye-catching and beautifully intricate armour worn by the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian I. And Henry didn't want to be outdone. When Henry came to the throne, he wasn't that impressed with the armouries of England. There were very few of them. There was one, definitely one in London, um, but it wasn't making armour of the quality he wanted. So he imported armourers from, from where we would now call Germany and the Low Countries, and he formed what still is the Royal Armouries. And they were there specifically to make high-quality armour for the king. Greenwich armour produced by the Royal Armouries was of the highest quality and distinctly decorative in fashion. But most of the armour that Henry had made was not intended for the battlefield, it was for the tournament. Henry loved to compete in the joust and that meant he needed the proper protection because the fact he was king didn't mean his opponents would let him win. You can't cheat with jousting. Nobody going up against Henry was letting him win. They were giving as good as they got. It's like a big game of chicken. There's, there's no defensive moves in jousting. You simply sit there and say, hit me, because I'm going to hit you. How does that feel, Your Majesty? Are you able to move properly? And, yes, uh, yes. Um, it would have been a real, a real thing to go and see the king jousting. Don't forget, this is... This is not a sport for the faint-hearted. This is dangerous, this is brutal. The king could and was injured on several occasions when he was jousting. From a young and healthy prince to a dangerously overweight middle-aged king, Henry's armor gives us an almost completely accurate account of his growing size. Well, we're quite lucky in the fact that we've got quite a lot of Henry's armor left almost from when he's a teenager right up until his later years, the last armours he wore when he invaded France. 
Um, what you could do, in fact, is you could put plaster into that armour, pour plaster in, and you'd have a, a very good record of how his body changes over the years. He's young and fit, uh, and then obviously he becomes uh, older and fatter as he exercises less and eats more. So you'd actually be able to see from those casts you could take of the inside of the armours how his girth grows. As Henry's size and weight started to increase, so too did his number of illnesses. But despite best efforts, Henry continued to suffer. He regularly underwent a wide variety of treatments, both conventional and experimental. It was probably during a bout of illness when he was surrounded by the physicians who were trying to cure him, that Henry himself became interested in the world of medicine. He granted a royal charter to establish the worshipful company of barber surgeons, shown in this painting by Hans Holbein, which still hangs here in the Great Hall today. One of the men depicted in the painting was Thomas Alsop, who was among Henry's most trusted physicians. Alsop was a skilled herbalist with extensive knowledge of pharmaceuticals. As such, the king granted him permission to gather what he needed to make his medicines from the royal herb gardens, like the one here at the worshipful company of barbers. Dr. Tim Cutler is honorary curator of their Tudor Physic Herb Garden. There's been a garden on this site since about 1450. It's that old? So the original hall had a garden, and uh, we have records of the beetle buying plants for it. With the same sorts of plants? Yes, probably a few more added, but we particularly commemorate John Gerard, who was master of our company in 1607. John Gerard was one of the first people in England to record and publish how plants and herbs could be used to cure various ailments. His book, Gerard's Herbal, brought together the theories and remedies that had been used by the likes of Thomas Alsop when developing treatments for Henry. Great botanist, surgeon, plantsman, gardener. Um, we have produced this garden in his memory really through his writings of Gerard's Herbal, which came out in 1597 and listed all the known medicinal plants of the time uh, and plants that were useful in many respects, both for medicine, both for scenting the air, uh, for dyeing clothes. Many of the herbs used in Tudor medicine can be commonly found in most kitchens today. Sage, marjoram and parsley were widely used in cures for common ailments known as simples. But the more complex the illness, the more outlandish the remedies. For example, if you had jaundice, you would likely be prescribed a revolting mixture of lice and ale to be drunk every morning. How important were herbs to Tudor medicine? Herbs were the basis of most medicines used at that time. They'd been described 1,500 years earlier by Dioscorides and Galen, and nothing had changed much. And it was not until Gerard's herbal came along that the subject was expanded to include more plants. Uh, but they were using the same herbs as, uh, as have been used for generations. Of course, Henry VIII's major health problem was his ulcerated leg. What sort of herbs would his doctors have used to try and cure that? There were quite a lot of plants used for wound care at the time, and Gerard writes uh, enthusiastically about them. Uh, he writes about Hypericum perforatum, um, the St. John's wort, which we know about for used in sort of mild depressive illness now. Uh, but Gerard rated it as, as very important for wound healing. He writes about our Camilla mollis, uh, ladies' mantle, um, the plant that still here look the dew is still on it dew was regarded as having very magical properties and dew gathers on uh, our camilla leaves and so this was thought to be very special and the mandrake ah very well known still it's unchanged for 2000 years i mean the history of the mandrake 
uh, goes back to the time of Christ. And this contains the active ingredient hyacinth that we now know about, but it was known as a very effective source of pain relief in those days. So his wound would have needed um, these uh, dressings to encourage it to heal. Henry's other preoccupation was, of course, the need to beget an heir. Now, were there any herbal remedies that could have helped his libido? Well, he might have tried the candied roots of sea holly, eryngium. Uh, that was marketed as an aphrodisiac, and that was certainly available in Tudor times. So I suspect he tried that from time to time. And given that he was king, of course, with all of these great remedies at his disposal, did he have any made specially for him? The king's grace's ointment was his own prescription. Uh, it was an ointment made from a plant we know well called the yellow sweet clover. Uh, if you pound it up, you get a nice, soft, mushy mix um, that produces a very soothing ointment. And it is written up in Henry's papers that it was used to cool um, the inf inflamed parts of his anatomy. We can leave it to your imagination as to which bits he needed to put it on, but um, there it was. It was his own ointment. That's a fascinating insight into Henry's personal life. The fact that Henry's health was in decline didn't stop him from moving on to his third wife, Jane Seymour. In 1538, within seven months of the marriage, Jane was pregnant. When word got out that the king's new wife was with child, there were celebrations across the land. Bonfires were lit, church bells were rung, and prayers were said in hope of a safe delivery. However, it would be anything but. Jane was forced to endure a 36-hour labor, which in Tudor times would have been extraordinarily painful and tortuous. Jane had a very long and arduous labor. Um, and there weren't that many comforts available to her. Modern pain relief, as we understand it, just didn't exist. And also the church uh, believed that women should experience this, this full manifestation of original sin. And so they frowned upon midwives administering things like opium. Prayers would be said, and the recitation of prayers and focusing on that could act as some kind of relaxant. Um, but other than that, um, there was obviously no ether, <laughs> there was no epidural. Herbs were used, uh, and some of them might actually have, have had some sort of effect, um, such as willow bark, which we know today that aspirin is made from. So there may have been something like that. It was common practice of the time that the expectant mother would have taken to her chamber to give birth, known as lying in she would have been shut off from public gaze and surrounded only by her female attendants, usually close friends known as godsips or gossips. The labor would almost always have been supervised by a midwife and men were strictly forbidden from entering the room. Jane Seymour's confinement and delivery was different because for the first time, Henry invited men into the chamber they were present during the time of delivery and afterwards. And we know this from a letter that survives that they all put their name to, including Henry's own physician, Sir William Butts. This is quite interesting in terms of a departure from tradition because it indicates Henry was very concerned about Jane's um, delivery and also about the survival of this child. It's as if he knew that this child was his last chance and he didn't want to take any risks with it and so he threw all his available resources at it. Henry may have had good intentions, but it was a decision that would have fatal consequences. Men, though, did have a more detached knowledge. Um, they didn't have hands-on experience. That was a very female thing. And also there's a status problem with men actually touching the queen's body. So men were probably standing back and observing while the women actually did the business of delivering the child and then bringing some of their academic knowledge to bear after the event. 
Jane eventually gave birth, giving Henry what he desired above all else, a son. Henry was overjoyed, but his happiness was short-lived. Just 12 days after giving birth to Henry's heir, Prince Edward, Jane tragically died. She contracted what was known at the time as childbed fever, which may have been caused by a retained placenta or by the unsanitary conditions in the birthing chamber. It's quite likely that the inclusion of men in, in the birthing room in Jane Seymour's case led to a conflict of interest. As the, the senior figures at court, their opinions would have trumped those of the women, and so they probably had the final say when it came to Jane's care. I think that Jane Seymour was deeply unfortunate in having royal physicians rather than midwives looking after her. The royal physicians just were not as experienced uh, and, and knew much less in relation to childbirth than did midwives. So it would have been exhausting as well as full of pain. And then, of course, she um, died afterwards because almost certainly the placenta did not come fully away. In the days after giving birth, we know that there were some criticisms made. Um, this comes from a letter from Thomas Cromwell who commented that she was allowed to catch cold and that she was allowed to indulge her fantasies in eating unsuitable foods. Possibly the academic knowledge triumphed over the experience. Um, and Jane's death may have been the result of an infection or possibly the fact that the men didn't know that part of her placenta may have remained in her womb and needed to be removed, which would, um, would have simply been whipped out by a midwife by hand. So the gender battle in the, the birth room might have resulted in, in Jane's premature death, which was possibly unnecessary. Henry was devastated at the loss of his wife. Writing of her death, he stated, Providence has mingled my joy with the bitterness of the death of her who brought me happiness. Henry would not remarry for more than two years. It would be the longest period that he'd be without a wife throughout the whole course of his reign. Henry was delighted to have a son at long last probably anxious about whether or not the son would live. Uh, and he seems to have been distraught by the death of Jane Seymour. She had delivered the child he had so much wanted. He hadn't been married her very long, so she hadn't alienated him as Anne Boleyn had done. And he withdrew rather as his father had at the time of the death of Elizabeth of York from public view and mourned in private. Henry was clearly grieved by Jane's death. A letter he wrote on that day said that she'd both given him this ultimate joy and ultimate grief in the fact that she had passed away at the time. However, Henry was fairly pragmatic, and although he went through the, the period of mourning, and he didn't marry again for a couple of years, he didn't stop looking at other women, and marriage negotiations were already taking place within months of Jane's death. So although he did mourn her on a personal level, he still knew he had a duty as a king to take on another queen and possibly try and father even more children. By the time Henry had reached the age of 50, the once slender and athletic king had become monstrously fat with a waist measuring 52 inches, a full 20 inches bigger than when he first came to the throne. It was said that three of the biggest men at court could fit inside the king's doublet. He was so fat that he had to be winched onto his horse and a special device had to be built to get him up and down stairs. Partly, it was due to his lack of exercise, but mainly 
It was the rich and plentiful food that was constantly on offer here at the palace. with his huge size and festering leg sores, that Henry would have been a little less choosy about potential matches. But nothing could be further from the truth. Arrangements are made for him to remarry, and it is suggested he chooses the daughter of an influential German Duke, Anne of Cleves. The artist Hans Holbein is dispatched to paint her portrait. He is told to capture her true likeness and not to flatter her. Upon seeing the painting, Henry immediately agrees to the marriage. But when he meets Anne in the flesh, he is utterly revolted. Not only is she ugly with very little resemblance to her portrait, but she's also said to have evil airs about her. But the contract has been signed. Henry has no choice but to go ahead and marry her. Henry made no secret of the fact that he did not find Anne pleasing to the eye. So what was it that he was looking for? What did Tudor men consider attractive? The Renaissance ideal of beauty was that a woman should be well-proportioned and graceful and be not too much of one thing and too much of another. So she shouldn't be too tall, she shouldn't be too short. Everything was in moderation. It showed harmony, which was the ideal. Your figure needed to be certainly not skinny because in Tudor times that suggested you were poor or possibly ill. And the big thing you wanted was to, for your future wife to be healthy. Certainly you wanted lots of babies if you were an aristocrat and lower down the social scale your wife had to be healthy because she was going to have to work really hard carrying around pails of water and all that no good being a weakling so they were looking for someone with clear skin with good teeth they were talking about particularly the smell of a woman they didn't want a woman who smelt of spices but a woman who smelt sweet and that might give an indication that she wasn't suffering from any um, rotten teeth or sores or anything unpleasant like that. They were also looking for a woman who was well made um, and who was clearly built for, for giving birth to children. So they wanted a fairly round hourglass figure, someone who would be able to bear a child healthily and go through the rigours of childbirth. One of the Tudor ideals, though, was that of a very fair complexion. And there were steps that women did take to, to try and lighten their complexions using things like lemon juice and other mixtures. And also, the Tudor red-gold hair was very famous, very popular at the time, and quite rare, which increased its, its value. There was no particular one type. The ideal was much more based on this notion of being well-proportioned and being graceful. Henry divorced Anne shortly afterwards, but although her lack of physical attractions has traditionally been blamed for the failure of her marriage to Henry, did the fault really lie with her husband? There is evidence that Henry was impotent by the time he married her. This is corroborated by the story of his next marriage. His fifth wife, Catherine Howard, was just a teenager when she married Henry, who was more than 30 years her senior. Although he couldn't keep his hands off her in public, in private, Henry failed to fulfill his husbandly duty. By 1541, and within just a few months of their marriage, Henry's health took another turn. His leg ulcer had become infected, and there was serious concern that the king might not pull through. Andrew Board, a physician who examined Henry at the time, described him as hugely obese, and having enlarged arteries with pale and sweaty skin. Aware that he was not looking his best, Henry would refuse to see his wife for weeks on end. <laughs> 
It wasn't long before Catherine started to seek sexual gratification elsewhere. And she soon found it in the shape of Thomas Culpepper, one of the king's closest servants. But nothing remained a secret at court for long. And when the affair was discovered, Catherine went straight to the block. A year later, Henry moved on to wife number six. On paper, his marriage to Catherine Parr seemed to be one of reason and practicality rather than passion. She was a wealthy 31-year-old widow with wit, intelligence, and an unblemished reputation. But she also understood Henry as a person and was attentive to the fact that his disastrous marriage to Catherine Howard had left him deeply lonely and unhappy. She provided him with all the care and comfort of a loving wife. Their marriage seemed to be set for success. But by the summer of 1546, Henry VIII was dangerously ill. His enormous girth and poor health meant his mobility was so restricted that he could barely walk. Only his closest body servants knew the full extent of the king's illness. They saw the suppurating ulcer on his leg, the stench from which was enough to turn the strongest of stomachs. The king was dying. From the middle of 1546, the king becomes less and less inclined to go out um, and spends more and more time in the privy chamber. He also is beginning to think about his plans for the succession and the fact that he's thinking in these terms, he's writing a will, he's talking about a council of regency, which is a very unusual idea. Henry started to make provisions for his death. He had officially declared his son Edward as heir to the throne. However, he was still just a boy, so the king appointed a regency council made up of 16 trusted men from his court to help him rule until Edward reached the age of 18. But Henry, knowing that he would not be there to protect Edward, and along with his ever-growing paranoia, set about ridding his son of any potential threats. He became convinced that members of his Privy Council would try to seize control after his death. Powerful men such as Bishop Gardiner, Henry Howard and his father Thomas were either excluded, imprisoned or executed. By taking out those big men, he thinks a group of smaller men will work better together. Um, of course, he doesn't really calculate on how ambitious the Seymours are. Little did Henry know that his wife Catherine would go on to rekindle her romance with Thomas Seymour. Together, they will attempt to influence the court of Edward when he becomes king. The Seymours also have made an, a very practical alliance with Catherine Parr, the last queen, and, and between them, they control the privy chamber at this stage. At the beginning of 1547, Henry moved to Whitehall Palace and retired to his private apartments, away from the prying eyes of the court. There, on the 28th of January, on what would have been his father's 90th birthday, he breathed his last. He had spent his last days bedbound, his doctors unable to tell him he was dying, as predicting the king's death was an act of treason. But with his room filled with the stench from his rotten ulcerations, they probably didn't have to. Henry summoned the archbishop to hear his last confession and absolve him of his sins in preparation for the afterlife. But by the time he reached the king, it was too late. Henry was 55 when he died, 27 years. Now it was time for his children, Edward, to take their turns as England's monarch. In the next episode, We'll see how a phantom pregnancy left Queen Mary a laughing stock at court. Examine the unusual methods of contraception practiced by the Tudor women 
but the first love of sugar and cosmetics left her a bald and toothless shadow of her former glory. Next time on The Private Lives of the Tudors. If you missed the first episode of The Private Lives... In the same boat together.